Ending School Segregation in the U.S. was published by ushistory.org and adapted by News ELA staff. The Pledge of Allegiance declares the people of the United States as one nation and indivisible. But early in the 20th century, the country existed as two nations in one. The Supreme Court ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896, wrote into law that America had two separate societies, one black and one white. It was permitted to keep the people apart, the ruling said, as long as the two were considered equal. Jim Crow Laws States across the North and South passed laws creating schools and public facilities for each race. These regulations, known as Jim Crow laws, reestablished authority of white people. Their power had diminished after the Civil War when slaves were freed and Southerners forged a new identity. Across the land, blacks and whites dined at separate restaurants they bathed in separate swimming pools and drank from separate water fountains. The search for equality. But America's segregation system exposed its hypocrisy. Change began brewing in the late 1940s when President Harry Truman ordered the end of segregation in the military and Jackie Robinson became the first African American to play Major League Baseball but the wall built by Jim Crow laws seemed impossible to overcome. The first major battleground was in the schools. It was very clear by the mid-1900s that Southern states had expertly built separate educational systems. These schools, however, were never equal. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, led by Thurgood Marshall, the great-grandson of a slave, sued public schools across the South. It said that the promise of separate but equal schools had been broken. States with laws keeping schools segregated never gave equal amounts of money to their black and white schools. Teachers in white schools were paid better wages, school buildings for white students were maintained more carefully, and money for school supplies was more abundant in white schools. States normally spent 10 to 20 times on the education of white students as they spent on African American students. Brown versus Board of Education. The Supreme Court finally decided to rule on this subject in 1954 in the landmark Brown versus Board of Education case. The verdict was unanimous against segregation. Separate facilities are inherently unequal read Chief Justice Earl Warren's opinion. Warren worked tirelessly to achieve a nine to zero ruling. He feared any disagreement might provide a legal argument for the forces against integration, that is, bringing white and black students back together. The United Supreme Court sent a clear message. Schools had to integrate. The North and the border states quickly complied with the ruling, but the Brown decision was not appreciated in the South. The court didn't force states to integrate right away, just local governments to comply as soon as possible. 10 years after Brown, fewer than 10% of Southern public schools had integrated. Some areas did not comply at all. The ruling did not address how white and black people still used separate restrooms, bus seats, or hotel rooms. Jim Crow laws stayed the same, but cautious first steps toward an equal society had been taken. It would take a decade of protest, legislation, and bloodshed during the civil rights movement of the 1960s before America got close to truer equality.